अनम्यूट करना गुड इवनिंग एवरी वन वेलकम टू ऑर्थो टीवी ऑनलाइन पोसी वेबिनार सीरीज टूडे वी हैव विथ हज डॉक्टर संजीव सबरवाल एंड आई एम हैंडिंग ओवर द मॉडरेशन टू डॉक्टर संदीप पटवर्धन हुज द सेक्रेटरी ऑफ पोसी Hi, good evening, everyone. We are uh, lucky to have Sanjeev Sabarwal with us. Everybody knows him, but let me briefly again introduce you to Sanjeev Sabarwal, who is now a professor of clinical orthopedics, University of California, San Francisco, and director and chief of orthopedics at the U UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital at Oakland. Sanjeev originally did his MBBS from MAMC Delhi in 1985, and then he moved to US. and did his uh, fellowships in boston and then los angeles and then a limb reconstruction and lengthening fellowship with uh, at the maryland center in baltimore uh, sanjeev not only is an orthopedic surgeon he is also done a masters in public health and he is uh, graduated as a hbs alumnus from the harvard business school in executive education so that's a lot of feathers in his cap If I read his CV, he's got 95 papers published to his name, and he has numerous uh, book chapters. And he has been the editor of a book on uh, deformity correction, which was released last year. And uh, we are lucky to have him with us today to talk on uh, uh, Blount's disease, tibia vara, something that is uh, that we thought we don't see so much in India. It's seen in India, but now we are seeing more and more. So over to you, Sanjay. Okay. Thank you, thank you, Sandeep, and thank you, Posey. Thank you, Dhiran, for inviting me. So um, we're going to jump right into Blount's disease, uh, and we'll talk about it in a case-based approach manner. And this will be followed by some case discussion by local faculty. Some of the cases that I haven't seen yet. Okay. Um, so you know, Blount back in uh, 1937 actually. said most of what we know right now and the only thing is he just looked at it in the frontal plane and didn't really talk more, more about the sagittal and the axial plane and then a few years later he came up with the blount staple uh, as they were um, known later uh, which is something that again um, has become popular lately with the guided growth and a slightly different implant um so you know as uh, um, as as we just heard um sandeep said you know they hadn't seen much blounts before and now you're seeing more of so it's not a surprise because blounts is uh, related to uh, childhood obesity it's not that every patient with blounts is obese but most of them are and uh, if you look at absolute numbers india has the second highest obese uh, population amongst the pediatric age group and uh, while the prevalence may not be as high in terms of the obesity Uh, the us is number 1 but in terms of absolute numbers obese kids uh, are more uh, prevalent more common commonly seen in uh, in india than in the us i just took this picture from the internet last night you can see this kid uh, who's a rural girl uh, who's a girl from rural india is obese and you can look at her left leg and sure enough it's got a little bit of varus and a little bit of internal tibial torsion so i bet you if somebody had done an x-ray of this child um, most likely she has blount's disease so blount's disease in general is uh, classified into early and late onset based on whether the age of onset not age of diagnosis but age of onset is before or after age 4 and maybe these are two slightly different pathologies and um, it just has a similar name and the reason i say that is that the demographics are also quite different early onset is more common in um, uh, more commonly bilateral and the gender distribution is almost equal boys and girls whereas late onset is often unilateral and uh, more common in boys and we did a little meta analysis just to confirm that when you look at a child with limb deformity and you think it's blounts or for that matter any limb deformity 
you should always look at it and think of it uh, three-dimensionally. So you're looking at it from the front, you're looking from the side, and you're looking at it axially. So for Blount's, the classic problem, as we know, is in the growth plate of the proximal tibia, posteromedially. And so it's no surprise that the deformities are varus, procurvatum, or apex anterior, slight internal tibial torsion, and of course, some um, uh, limb shortening. Now, you know, there are a lot of different radiographic parameters that have been um, talked about. The one that's uh, most commonly referred in terms of differentiating a very young child, let's say a two-year-old uh, physiologic varus versus uh, infantile or early onset blounts is looking at the metadiaphyseal angle. Um, I mean, I look at that angle and measure it, but it's not the only or the most reliable measurement. In, in it, but it is a good screening tool. Um, so the classic paper from Levine and Drennan talked about 11 degrees as the, as the, here, every time I, okay. So I think you can see my arrow too. So the metadiaphyseal angle is measured uh, with a straight line along the lateral cortex of the proximal tibia and a second line along the metaphysis of the lateral and the medial beak uh, of the proximal tibia. And then you measure this angle and as I said, the initial paper talked about 11 or more degrees suggestive of blounds, and then a subsequent paper talked about 16 being more reliable as a cutoff number. Um, I think what's also uh, important now that we have all the numbers of looking at limb malorientation, such as the lateral distal femoral angle, et cetera, is to look at where the varus is coming from. If the varus is more in the femur as opposed to the tibia, then I think it's more likely to be physiologic in a young child, as opposed to if the varus is more in the tibia versus the femur, more likely to be uh, suggestive of blounds. Um, this is sort of the classic picture that Langen School uh, defined as, uh, you know, the six stages. Not every child with early onset blounds will go through these stages, uh, but it is age dependent. And uh, uh, as most of us know, the first couple of uh, stages, stages one and two um, are definitely reversible. Three, it's debatable, but most people think yes, most cases of stage three are reversible. But as you go to the higher stages, the child gets older and the reversibility gets less to almost non-existent um, in stage five and six. So, you know, when you see a child besides physical exam and history, you're gonna get full length standing x-rays. And yes, you can measure the metadiaphyseal angle here, but it's quite obvious that this child has medial beaking of the metaphysis. You start with the, uh, you know, measuring and quantifying the mechanical axis deviation. And I'm not gonna get into those details. I think you've had some webinars in the past talking about that. And then, like we said, you look at the lateral distal femoral angle, center of the head of the femur to the uh, center of the knee joint, and you measure this lateral angle. And if it's more than 87, 88 degrees, that suggests varus coming from the femur. In the tibia, it's the medial angle, the medial proximal tibial angle. And again, an MPT of less than 88 degrees uh, would suggest varus coming from the tibia. Now, it's interesting, in a younger child uh, before age seven, as they have physiologic varus, a normal LDFA is probably gonna be much higher. And we actually quantified that in terms of the reference values for younger children for these malorientation angles uh, in a paper in JPL. Um, again, just like physical exam, don't forget looking at the lateral view and because of procurvatum, their proximal posterior tibial angle is going to be less than 80 degrees, which is normal. So this is just another typical uh, moderately severe early onset blounds. And you can see all these numbers suggest a blounce as opposed to a physiologic varus. Besides looking at the classic x-rays and the severe deformity, her LDFA was normal at 87 degrees. Um, this was a study we, we did. And just back to the point, just because an LDFA is more than 87 doesn't always mean um, that there's a problem. In early onset, as you know, it's physiologic. So 
even in the control group, their normal LDFA was uh, you know, much higher than 87, but it was very similar in the two groups. Late onset is a different story. Late onset, you should have a normal adult number of 87, 88 degrees. So if you have virus, it's not uncommon. About a third of the time in late onset uh, blounts, you'll get some virus. People say about a third of the virus may be coming from the distal femur, which has uh, you know, treatment implications that you may wanna address the femur virus as well as the proximal tibial virus. Now, recently there was a, another publication about looking at the uh, prognostic value of uh, the appearance of the proximal tibial metaphysis. And uh, this paper from Scottish Wright by L Lamont and et al has gained some popularity. And what they did is they tried to prognosticate in terms of which children, if you did a realignment osteotomy, will have a lesser chance of recurrence. While I think it's a step in the right direction, I don't think it, it totally solves the problem because you can see in, the, in this figure from the paper, um, the recurrence is in the darker shade. And yes, there is a sequential increase in recurrence as you get to, the, to, to grade C, which is where there is a very vertical type of a slope uh, compared to stage B, where there is more of a cupping of the metaphysis. So yes, it has, uh, it makes sense and it has some validation, but I think more needs to be done in this area. <clears throat> um, we did a study looking at the MRI appearance uh, of children with blounts because this comes up often in the literature and it's still not fully resolved that when you see this empty space, what's going on there? And, and as we would expect, some of it is unossified cartilage and that's something that Trueta and others have talked about for many, many years, where if there is uh, increased pressure in the, around the growing cartilage, there's gonna be suppression of ossification. And you kind of see that here on the MR. And interestingly, we also found that there was compensatory thickening of the medial meniscus. And so it's not like an empty space. A lot of times in young children, it's not a depressed plateau uh, as such, although the competence of this softer cartilaginous onlog compared to the bone uh, is definitely there. Uh, we also found that interestingly, the medial meniscus was also thicker posteriorly, which is interesting because you get procarvatum of the bone. So it seems like the meniscus actually thickens preferentially medially and posteriorly so as to compensate for the bony deficiency. Uh, but when, when we looked at the, the joint orientation, including the, the meniscus, it was actually not depressed. The joint wasn't depressed in a lot of these children. Um, recently, we also noted that um, some of these children, about 10% based on x-rays and about 20% based on MRI, will have this OCD or osteochondritis desiccans type of a lesion in the ipsilateral distal femur. And we were worried whether this was really that pathologic and something needed to be done. But thankfully, um, pretty much all of them disappear once the bone is realigned in the proximal tibia. So I don't think you need to drill it or do any kind of grafting, but you, can, you, you will often see an OCD type of a lesion in the distal femur. And it was not related to age, gender, or the magnitude of deformity. So what are the goals of treatment in a child with Blount's disease? It's just like any other limb deformity. You wanna correct the bony deformity, establish joint orientation angles to close to normal values. Don't forget equalizing the limb length while preserving function and minimizing morbidity. Uh, so there's bracing in the younger child, there's guided growth and there's osteotomy. Um, in my practice, bracing doesn't have a huge role, but Based on the literature, it's commonly used for children with established blounts who are less than three years old and have a mild deformity, i.e. a Langen school one or a two. Um, this was a child um, that was treated by my former partner, uh, two-year-old Gino Verum. And you can see it's, uh, if you look at um, the radiograph to the left, 
There is some beaking, but I think the metadiaphyseal angle was around 15, 16 degrees. So um, this child was braced and yes, it got better, but as she got older, it, it didn't fully correct. So she ended up with guided growth anyway. So the question is, is this a bracing success or a failure? And I think that's where the literature uh, gets a little bit muddied. Uh, on top of that, some of these children are physiologic, uh, virus, and they would self-correct. So it, it's, it's hard to really sort out uh, what's going on with the efficacy of bracing. The concept, of course, is simple and time-tested in terms of improving the forces across a growth plate to modulate it. But uh, I think the reality is quite complicated. So these are some of the issues with the data and the literature, um, you know, things we mentioned. And of course, the, the level of evidence is really not very good because there's hardly any control groups and the compliance of brace, with bracing has not been well established. So how about the surgical options? Um, we've got you know, two big groups. We've got growth modulation, um, be it with implants or with drilling. And then we've got osteotomies um, either in the femur, uh, I'm sorry, either in the tibia or with or without the femur. And of course, there is the option of a plateau elevation of the medial site in, in a select group of patients. So I'm gonna show you some cases as we move along. Uh, so what we do know about Blounts and especially the early and middle stages is that there is compressive forces across the medial growth plate, which will cause growth inhibition, but it is not an all or none phenomenon. So while the growth plate is sick, it's certainly not dead in the, in the earlier phases of Blounts. Um, so this is a child, three year, 11 month, uh, with left-sided genovarum related to Blounts. Um, uncommon presentation in a non-obese child, but it seems real. Um, so here it is with a guided growth. Uh, I do use an arthrogram quite liberally in the younger child uh, in order to make sure for two reasons. One, you can look at the, uh, the medial plateau and you can see while it's not ossified, the medial plateau and the joint is quite level. And secondly, it helps with the uh, screw placement in the epiphysis. Now, if you really want to be clever and if there is procarvartum, you can differentially put the plate slightly anteriorly to get biplanar correction. Um, so in a younger child, I think it's good to overcorrect it a little bit. And how much to overcorrect, um, I think uh, is not being fully established, but I would say for the most part, I, I go to the border of the bone and the lateral border, meaning zone two, three junction, um, sort of like what's shown in that uh, picture on the left. Um, and then we take the implant out um, and then ex uh, do expect some rebound. Uh, and you got to warn the family that you may have to go back again. Um, so that, that's something that's common in a lot of uh, guided growth treatment, especially in the younger child. Um, so this was uh, another child, the genovarum was treated, similar overcorrection on both sides. This is probably the youngest that I've done, um, which was just over two years old, two and a half, I think. Um, but I think anything younger is probably too young. But now that we have better implants, I think uh, this is reasonable as long as you're careful and don't violate the underlying uh, perichondrium. So here she is with some expected rebound, but the story is not over. She'll still need to be followed up. Um, this thing about a sleeper plate was uh, sort of a little bit in vogue a uh, couple of years ago where you don't take the entire implant plate screw construct out, but you just remove the metaphyseal screw. But a recent study from Israel um, cautioned us that that's not a smart move because and these were children with other diseases too, but growing children with guided growth treatment that you could still have issues with itrogenic uh, uh, injury to the, to the underlying growth plate. And a lot of times the implant will move. So I think for the most part, it probably makes more sense to just take the entire plate out with both screws on the plate, as opposed to just the metaphyseal screw. Uh, when you look at uh, reports such as this. 
Um, guided growth or hemiapiphysiodesis is not for every child. This is a much older child with uh, much severe deformity, quite obese, so uh, not unexpected. This uh, did not work. So if you look at the literature, um, I think guided growth is most suitable for mild to moderate deformity and different papers have quantified it differently. Um, but in general, varus of less than 15, a medial proximal tibial angle of greater than 75, and a mechanical axis deviation of six centimeters or less with at least two years of growth remaining and a mild leg length discrepancy. And some papers have also talked about worse prognosis in the heavier child. Um, this is another screenshot of some of those figures which uh, talk about the same issues and prognostic factors. Now, um, this again is well known that a lot of times the implant may break, the guided growth implant. And usually where it breaks is, is, is exactly where the screw enters the bone in the tibia. And that may be related to the offset between the uh, screw and the, and the bone. Um, so ways that can minimize this, but not totally obviate it is using two plates using a stiffer metal like stainless steel, using solid screws, uh, et cetera. Now, sometimes you can use guided growth for the older child as well. So this child was heavier, had mild varus on the one side, and as expected, the left leg was slightly shorter than the right. So here, uh, we did use guided growth with two plates on the left side, and his, uh, his varus was slightly coming from the femur as well as the tibia, we could note the two plates on the femur on the left. And in order to address the leg length discrepancy, we did uh, you know, slow down the growth uh, on the right side as well, since he had some growth remaining. And so here he is at skeletal maturity, not the best looking x-rays because of his obesity, but you could see his mechanical axis is well lined up and clinically he looks much better. One word of caution in the obese person that you're trying to correct the varus. If a child is heavy with large thighs, they will not tolerate overcorrection into valgus. They won't like it, and it's not very uh, physiologic for them. So sometimes it's good to just correct them to neutral um, in the older child with large thighs. And perhaps while debatable, you can occasionally undercorrect them a little bit intentionally um, especially if the other side is not gonna be addressed and um, they like the way the, the, the knee alignment is on the opposite leg. Now, what are the risk factors for recurrence of osteotomies? We briefly talked about the Lamont uh, classification uh, and no surprise, an obese kid, if you do the osteotomy later and it's in the advanced stages of Langenskold and you do not fully correct the virus, um, you're gonna have a higher chance of recurrence. Now, here's a, a patient that I did way back 20 plus years ago. And honestly, I wasn't very happy with the outcome uh, because uh, this was a seven year old who we did an oblique sort of a RAB osteotomy, which is an inclined osteotomy to correct the varus and the internal tibial torsion. Um, and uh, it was popular for a while. And I think it still is an effective way of doing things, because as you incline the saw, you can dial in how much uh, varus versus internal tibial torsion correction you want. If you put the saw blade at 45 degrees, you're, you're gonna get equal amount of varus and torsional correction. If you make that saw blade more horizontal, you're gonna get more torsional correction and um, opposite effect if you incline the saw blade uh, distally. Uh, from distal to proximal. Anyway, this wasn't the best correction that I wanted, uh, but here he, she is eight years later. So the point is sometimes you do get lucky and you get reasonable results, but you should always aim to um, realign the, the, the tibia to a normal position and not leave them undercorrected. Now, what about gradual correction? I think this is a much stronger tool and has become more common in the last decade or so, because not only does it safely allow you to safely address all components of the deformity, including the length, 
but you can um, sort of dial things in as opposed to doing an acute correction. Um, and as we know, not only do you correct the deformity, but you also have to appropriately laterally translate the distal fragment of the tibia in children with blounds so as to not create an itrogenic uh, deformity. So this is a four-year-old bilateral varus, right worse than left. Uh, MRI is showing again that thickening of the medial meniscus, unossified chondroepiphysis medially. And here she is corrected. Uh, again, is it over? Not at all, um, because she might recur. Uh, acute versus gradual, I think uh, it's sort of surgical uh, surgeon's choice, but there's no question that if you do an acute correction of the proximal tibia, especially with a severe deformity, there is a higher chance of compartment syndrome, perineal nerve injury, not sort of getting the most optimal uh, correction. Uh, some lessons we've learned, this was an obese child, uh, late presentation of uh, uh, infantile blounds. And um, I showed you these x-rays before. And so intentionally we overcorrected her slightly and I was pretty happy with the overall correction. What happened was that as the frame came off, she was only nine years old, nine plus, and her growth plate had already closed. And then when I asked her, she'd started having her menstrual period. And you can see what we were talking about, how the valgus of the right doesn't look that great. So then we did a study and basically what we found out was children with blounds, because they're obese, get precocious puberty. So they have advanced bone age. So that's something you just, you do need to keep in mind. So the point of this study was that do not overcorrect and keep this sort of limited growth potential in mind in the obese child with blounds. And, uh, and it's a good idea to get a bone age before you embark on a treatment um, because a lot of times they'll have advanced bone age. Um, so a few more cases. So the importance of measuring the joint orientation angle. So this child, 12 years old, had a lateral distal femoral angle of 97, indicating some varus coming from the femur besides the tibia. She was short on that side. So you can um, do a sort of hybrid technique, I guess, with osteotomy of the tibia with gradual correction and growth modulation of the femur. Whereas this child, who's more uh, skeletally mature, near, nearly fully mature, but has substantial varus coming from the femur, uh, and is short, I think you need to do uh, osteotomy at both levels. And this is an older case. Uh, so we did do a frame on the femur too, but I think there are other ways, including a nail and plate that you could, uh, could address this as well. Uh, but we did get a decent correction and intentionally undercorrected him a tiny bit. And you can see, he doesn't look like he's in varus, but radiographically, he still has a tiny bit of varus and a mild leg length discrepancy. So I think gradual correction is comprehensive as it allows for a multiplanar correction, allows for the limb shortening to be addressed, is more accurate than an acute correction, safe and reliable in most people's hands. Um, things can happen on the lateral view as well. Uh, as we said, there's procurvartum, and we did a study looking at the correlation of the clinical exam, which shows a flexion deformity often and the radiographic uh, uh, alignment such as the PPTA. And while there was a linear correlation between the two, the radiographs were more severe in terms of ma magnitude than the clinical uh, picture. But you do not need to undercorrect the bony procurvartum. So you should normalize the PPTA even though your clinical flexion deformity is less. Um, and that's what we found in this study. Now, a few other cases with different treatment options, a seven-year-old with recurrent deformity after an osteotomy. Uh, this is many years ago. We tried guided growth back then with staple, did not work. And the reason it didn't work is because uh, she had a bony bar. So this is you know, a more advanced stage of uh, Langen School. Obviously, guided growth isn't gonna work in the face of a contralateral bar. And you can see, here, the child is older 
And yes, she has a structural problem with the orientation of the medial plateau. So this is a good, good example of uh, an indication for a plateau elevation. And every time you do a plateau elevation, you need to ablate the lateral proximal tibial growth plate and often the proximal fibular growth plate as well in order to minimize the chance of recurrence. And for the most part, you need to put something structural in the, in the opening uh, that you create following the plateau elevation and usually a nice robust screw uh, across the epiphysis. So in general for plateau elevation, you need to do it for advanced Langen school stages. I don't think it's necessary uh, for the younger child uh, before age six or seven. Different techniques have been used in terms of plates, screws, fixators, combined with the metaphyseal osteotomy, and maybe we can go into those uh, discussion points later in the, in the group discussion. Uh, but again, always remember to combine that with the lateral hemiapiphysiodesis of the proximal tibia and mostly of the femur. Uh, and remember that this option doesn't address the limb shortening. So you may have to do other things such as a contralateral epiphysiodesis or do a simultaneous or a staged proximal tibial osteotomy in the metaphysis uh, to address the limb shortening. And there's multiple papers, some of which are cited here. Now, here's an interesting case where I had many, many problems with this child, but I think is a good example to show what can happen with Blounce. So seven-year-old with Blounce, right, worse than left, limb shortening. Um, so, I thought I would customize treatment and on the right would do a gradual correction with an osteotomy and a frame and on the left uh, do guided growth. And if you look at the dates in the bottom, you can see sequentially the story here. So over a seven month period, he starts having recurrence on the right and then um, he gets lost to follow up. And so this is what happens and patients don't follow up and I'll back up again. So he went from where, look at the left first, from Veras, now he's going drifting into valgus. So he's overcorrected on the left and he's really not correcting on the right. If anything, it's getting worse. So then he shows up and we do, we take the plate out on the left side. Um, and on the right, uh, there's an, a CT scan which shows a physeal bar. So we do a plateau elevation with you know, modest improvement, but not fully correcting or realigning his mechanical axis. The left side is drifting back into towards the knee, which is a good sign, but what happens? So not only does the left side get to the knee, it goes past in the other direction. On the right side, while there was a little bit of joint obliquity, I wanted to reestablish the mechanical axis. So we did put, a plate on the distal femur. And this is debatable in terms of, do you intentionally realign the mechanical axis while creating a mild joint line obliquity? And again, that's, that's a discussion that can be had. But looking at the left, it went from a reversible problem to now an irreversible problem as the child grew. And we have a CT which shows that not only on the right, but on the left, he had uh, a bony bar. So that's why he's, uh, he's not growing on the medial side, despite putting that plate again on the left side. So this is a very instructive case. Um, and then on the left, again, we had to do a plateau elevation and you've got an orthogram which shows we've reestablished the, the joint line. And because he's an older child, I think uh, a plate was a more sturdy implant. The good news is that at skeletal maturity, he's got pretty decent limb alignment and leg length equalization, and he's done growing. So I think the point of this case is, yes, you're gonna get through some issues and hurdles, but you gotta stay with it. Don't lose the patient to follow up. And from day one, establish a relationship to say that you may need multiple procedures because we're chasing growth and it's unpredictable. Here's another child, 10 year old recurrent deformity from an osteotomy done elsewhere. And this case is shown primarily to say that if you look at the CAT scan, the 3D, 
it's not a simple plateau depression. The depression sometimes is central and those are very hard to address just with a simple plateau elevation. So I don't think there is a great solution, at least in my hands, but something to just study and think about. Uh, and, and most of the time, the depression is more posteriorly than anteriorly. So when you are, you are putting that graph, you got to put it preferentially more posteriorly in order to correct that poker value. Uh, the other thing in terms of planning, you know, when to do a plateau elevation, when to do a metaphyseal osteotomy, when to do both. And I find this as a good tool to study that. So the first measurement you do on the left is looking at the MPTA from, um, from tip to tip, lateral to medial, and measuring that. So here the MPT is 59. Then in the middle one, you're just drawing a tangential line across the lateral plateau and measuring the epiphyseal deformity, which in this case was substantial, was 36 degrees. And then in the third one to your right, you disregard the medial plateau and just extend that lateral plateau line across to measure the metaphyseal deformity, which in this case was seven degrees. So I think just by this simple little exercise preoperatively, you can sort out what is needed geometrically. So in this case, we thought most of it was related to the plateau. So we did a plateau elevation and um, did not really need to do anything for the metaphysis. And again, back because he has large thighs and while he's still a tiny bit short on that side, given the overall picture and his activity level, et cetera, uh, this was very reasonable and uh, acceptable to him and his family. Now, you know, another question that comes up is, these are obese children. You straighten out their legs, are they gonna be more active and are they gonna lose weight? And we did the study which actually disappointingly showed that despite counseling, nutrition, et cetera, most if not all of these children, you know, kept getting heavier. The one patient who you see circled around who didn't get heavier is the only patient who had a bariatric procedure. So I'm not plugging in for a bariatric surgery for children, but all I'm saying is that realigning their limbs does not fix their obesity. Now, I'll end with two adult cases, which are lessons learned. So this was a 22 year old who came to me after having had multiple surgeries elsewhere. And you can see if things are not done right, despite multiple surgeries, you know, it's not a happy situation. You got broken implants, various, and all we did was take the implants out and straighten out the leg gradually. And um, you can see how much length is gained, not by lengthening the leg, but just by straightening the deformity. So you cannot do this acutely, uh, obviously with all the neurovascular issues in mind. So then we did the same thing on the left side and you can again see the translation that's necessary to get a good biplanar correction. The final case is a 46 year old uh, female who was sent to me by uh, arthroplasty surgeon because she has had six surgeries previously uh, overseas for blounds when she was younger. And not only is she short and in various and has multiple scars, but also if you look at her x-rays, she's got that itrogenic residual medial translation of the tibia and yes, medial compartment arthritis. And if you look at her numbers, it's all coming from the tibia. She's got the varus and the procurvartum and yes. So the intent here was to help the orthoplasty surgeon get the tibia realigned so that she can have a total, uh, total knee arthroplasty. And so we did a osteotomy to, you know, just the standard to gradually straighten it out. But you could see how much tra translation of the distal fragment was needed in order to realign it. So yes, the x-rays look very strange, but that's what's needed to realign the tibial axis. And then in terms of limb alignment, we have the mechanical axis going just lateral to the uh, mid midpoint, which is the Fujisawa point. And I think that's been recommended as a nice sweet spot 
when you're trying to correct, uh, you know, medial sided pain in a patient with genuvarum from the tibia, which is about 40% of the distance from the midpoint to the lateral edge of the tibial plateau, uh, well known as the Fujisawa point. So here she was six months later, much happier, despite having tricompartmental arthritis. And here she was 10 years later, refusing to get a total knee because she was very functional and pain-free. So uh, I think there are many unresolved issues still <coughs> with Blounts. We still don't know the etiology, whether the early onset and the late onset are really the same problem or not. Um, and why do some patients get unilateral disease and others bilateral? You know, the difference between static and dynamic alignment, which one do you go for? Because a lot of these children in the severe disease will have some um, joint line laxity, pseudo laxity with various thrust when they walk. And uh, as we said earlier, what is the optimal limb alignment in patients who are obese? And it goes beyond just blounds. You know, what they feel good with is a little bit of undercorrection. And that's what feels good, looks good to them. Uh, but if you realign them and overcorrect them, I think they don't like it. But I don't know if from a joint perspective, biomechanically, what is optimal? So I think that needs to be studied further. And again, how much joint line obliquity is acceptable? And you know, the conjecture is five degrees is acceptable of overcorrection, like the case I showed you. And then some people think that there's a good combo and a bad combo like a distal femoral valgus with a proximal tibial varus is worse in terms of shear forces across the knee than having a distal femoral varus with a proximal tibial valgus. But I think that concept needs to be studied and proven. And then finally, you know, what about a DVT or a VTE prophylaxis for deep vein venous thrombosis in some of these obese adolescents? you know, what's necessary, what's indicated. I've heard of anecdotal uh, reports of, you know, obese children with blounts having, uh, you know, having um, a pulmonary embolus after the, uh, an osteotomy and uh, limited mobility. So I think the take home final is, you know, comprehensive pre-op analysis, just like any child with limb deformity, specifically in obese children when you're contemplating some kind of surgical correction, do a bone age study to look for advanced bone age. Try to address all deformities. And if you're trying to ignore, let's say the femur, make sure that you're not creating an iatrogenic overcorrection in the proximal tibia. And I think for now, strive for less than five degrees of joint obliquity uh, and no more. Uh, avoid iatrogenic deformities, primarily translate the tibia laterally because the problem and the spot weld is in the proximal tibia. So if you're doing a metaphyseal osteotomy, you've got to laterally translate that distal fragment. And as we've seen in one or two of these cases that I showed, you got to follow these children to skeletal maturity before you can establish that you've reached your goal. And uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjeev. That was absolutely fantastic collection of cases and concepts. So we are already bombarded with questions. So I hope you are ready for, yeah, you have your drink of water. Uh, yeah. Uh, the most yeah. popular question that seems to be around as asked by multiple people is either guided growth or chronic uh, long-standing deformity. How do you tackle the ligamentous laxity? What happens to the ligaments? Because despite correction, when they load it, the ligaments are overstretched. And what does what effect does guided growth have on laxity? So that's been asked by Jayant, Atul, and a lot many more people. Yeah. So I think guided growth in general, I mean, laxity in general is a surrogate or is an indicator that there is, it's, it's almost like, you know, in the classic medial plateau fracture patients in adults, you're like, you got to look at various valgus and stability with the knee in full extension. And I think it, it is secondary to some kind of a medial incompetence, which secondarily, you know, stretches the lateral side. So 
I think the laxity laterally is secondary and the primary problem is medial with some kind of incompetency. And those are the cases where, you know, even if the MRI shows or the orthogram shows that the plateau is, is level, structurally the, the medial plateau cannot take that weight. So yes, in a younger child, guided growth would still be what I would recommend. Um, if a child is more than six, seven, so it, again, depends on the age and the exam and, and, and a specific uh, sort of you know, case. But in general, I don't think you need to do a lot of sort of lateral collateral ligament tightening work despite that's been popularized by some, but I, I don't find that necessary in blounts. Now, what you could do sometimes let's say if you're lengthening in an older child, an adolescent, you're lengthening, or they've got, let's say two, two and a half centimeters of leg length discrepancy and varus, and you're gonna realign the proximal tibia. You, you may fix the tibia to the fibula distally at the syndesmosis, not cut the fibula, don't do a fibular osteotomy with the intention being that you're pulling down the fibula a little bit. But there is a word of caution. One is that if you do it in a younger child, I've seen a case where that proximal fibular apophysis can pull off. So you got to be judicious. So you don't want to do too much of this differential correction. But yeah, you can do some. And if you really need to do it in a younger child, or you need to lengthen a lot, then you can put a small intraepiphyseal screw with an open technique because the perineal nerves right there and just put an intraepiphyseal screw in the proximal fibula in order to avoid that pulling off. So there are many techniques, but I think in general, right. you could focus on the primary problem, which is the medial side. Medial side and lateral laxity, you feel every time you don't need a tightening procedure. No, no, I don't think okay. so. A lot of people have also asked the indication for medial hemiplatoo elevation. Where do you get the graph from? Do you osteotomize the fibula when you do a double osteotomy or elevation? How do you tackle the fibula? Do you need to cut it? Yeah. So, okay. So many questions in there and I'll tell you what my practice is. I, for the most part, will stage it. Even if somebody has you know, substantial metaphyseal deformity and an epiphyseal problem. I like to do just the epiphysis first, if that's, you know, a substantial problem for multiple reasons. One is you, you can focus more and you don't have to worry about the distal fragment in terms of, you know, how much real estate you have there. Secondly, despite best intentions, you really quite don't know how much of correction you're actually gonna get. In terms of graft, I use a structural graft. We have the luxury of having a bone bank. So we use a femoral head allograft and you know you can shape it. But I know some places you don't have that luxury. And I would say, I would still use a structural graft. I think like places like India where you're so good with harvesting the fibula, if you do it sort of in the central two third, that may be an option and you can make it into two pieces and tamp it. I think you guys do it better than anybody else. Um, but I think something structural is good. In terms of cutting yeah. the fibula, I, I don't think it's necessary to cut the fibula. If anything, it's going to add to the laxity. So, so I leave the fibula intact and... Um, Even with an osteotomy? Uh, of a plateau elevation, yeah. Oh, if, I'm, so only for, if you're doing a yeah, double yeah. osteotomy, it, you would cut it. Yes, yeah, for double osteotomy, I guess I would cut it, but as I said, I, I don't do the two at the same time. If I'm coming right. back Stay, to do a metastasis, yeah. yeah. Okay, okay, so there is a question from <coughs> What is your opinion on FE5 show lysis for early blocks rather than stapling one uh, side? Can we distract the physis on that? I think conceptually it makes sense. The problem is that the bar is not very peripheral and it's not very discreet. And so, and there was a good study that came out of Scottish, right? I don't know if it got published, but I heard it a couple of times where they followed and they, they are one of the sort of bigger proponents of physial bar excision. And even in their series, from what I recall, 
the Blounds kids did actually the worst, one of the worst, if not the worst. And, okay. and I think it's okay. not a surprise because it's not a clear spot weld most of the times, and it's not that, uh, that sort of discreet. And finally, you don't have that much of a healthy growth plate even around it. Okay, so uh, right now the consensus is still on the lateral hemiapiphyseal disease rather than trying to do bar excision or epiphyseolysis. Yes, but I'm not saying right that now. never do it like in, in a, so because that's where the irony is, as you've seen in the Langenskold classification, you don't get a bar, a discrete bony bar till it's Langenskold six or advanced okay. stage five. And that's in an okay. older child, nine, 10 years old. Okay, okay. So uh, there are a few more questions. What is your youngest age for a hexapod? Oh, well, I mean, again, more and more, the, it again goes back to what you see in Blounds. You, you don't see a three, I would say I've done it in a three and a half, four year old, but I'll always try, yeah, probably three and a half to four. Uh, okay. But I, I think if it's a mild to moderate deformity with the implants available, I would do guided growth. The, the flip side okay. is, as, as we've known, that if you go past age four for osteotomies, your chance of recurrence increases. So you've got to balance the two out. Okay. So a couple of people have asked, how do you prevent compartment syndrome? What is your... Well, okay. Uh, so one is minimize or avoid doing an acute correction, especially severe, uh, you know, severe angular correction. And that goes for any proximal tibial osteotomy. You could certainly do a prophylactic anterior compartment fasciotomy if you are doing an acute correction. Um, okay. And then again, just the typical close watchfulness. Don't if yes. you're putting a circumferential cast, you know, yes. watch it. So if you're doing an acute extensive correction, adding a fasciotomy anteriorly would be a good choice. Absolutely. I, I not only it would be a good thing in my mind. I think that's pretty much mandatory. It, and, okay. and I'm not saying you open the skin all the way, but at least slide a fasciotome or a scissors to safely decompress that anterior compartment. Okay. There's a very interesting question from Vidya Sagar. He says that proximal tibial osteotomy, normally with a fracture at four or five years, we see Posen's phenomenon. So does an osteotomy cause that because he has seen one in his practice and he says that then do you, should you overcorrect because the natural tendency is to drift to valgus. Yeah, that's well. That is an interesting question and makes physiologic sense. Having said that, I think the in blounts, I don't see it. Like, if anything, it drifts back to varus. I've never seen a patient, and again, it's just my experience. But I haven't even like seen others present. So it'll be a good one to write up. The other thing I okay. and I'll tell you one little an anecdote. One one kid I saw who was treated in a brace who actually did not have blounts. And he ended up with a valgus. With overdose. valgus. So okay. a lot of times, if you do it in a young child, the diagnosis may not even be blast. Yes. Yeah. So Atul is asking, you showed some osteotomies, redo osteotomies in one of your cases. What were the medial plates that you used? Don't they cause oh, prominence? Well, they I look mean, like gondola plates. Of, yeah, yeah. So those were, again, I don't want to like commercialize <laughs> any implant company, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, the name starts with S. And it's it's a, it's an adult medial uh, plateau plate, uh, the three five. So I I think okay. a, but even in that one, I think you you have to still use benders and all to contour the plate. Um, the the one yeah. interesting technical note here is that when you're doing a plateau elevation in an older kid, try to put the screws first and put them in the back, like more posteriorly, so your plate can sit more anteriorly. <laughs> and one other technical trick is, as you're trying to tamp the graft, you try to get, you know, valgus overcorrection with either a assistant or a fixator and, you know, use a fixator assisted kind of technique. Okay. We'll take a couple of more questions <laughs> before we go to our cases. There's one from Rujuta who's asking, uh, how do you release the soft tissue uh, when you're doing the hemiplateau elevation, the MCL and the PES? Uh, any tips on managing the soft tissue for a generous elevation to put a really good graft? 
Yeah, I mean, you, you got to stay subperiosteal. You got to go sort of underneath the PES and the MCL. And, and you know, it is interesting. The tendency a lot of times is to start the cut a little more distal than what you want. If you start the cut more distal, it creates this bigger spike of bone in the epiphysis. So while you don't want to go, no, I mean, people have talked about going right at the physis. I don't do that. I go just a little past that where a lot of time there's a little groove. And okay. I take that as, as an indicator and then obviously do multiple drill hole, straighten the osteotomes. And, um, and sometimes I'll make a little bit of a bigger hole at my end point, which is close to the junction between the two tibial spines and then kind of slowly jack it up. With the soft tissues, it's just like go sub MCL and okay. uh, tamp in a robust graft, preferentially posteriorly. Okay, okay. A couple of more questions before we go to cases. One is Ashish Ranade is asking when you do a fixator assisted correction, uh, do you do the fibular osteotomy then? What do you mean for a for a plateau elevation? Fix it. No, no, for a, a second stage osteotomy when you do the osteotomy with lengthening. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um, I've only had to do it a couple of times, but it goes back, if, if you are, if you don't need much length and you're just doing it for angular correction and I want to say like two-ish centimeters, I will usually not cut the fibula, not but two. I will transfix no, it. Sure. No, okay. no, I will transfix yeah. it distally though. And there's so a paper you're very, I'm very conservative you. with cutting the fibula. You won't cut it too often. No, I, I will only cut it if it's needed for length purposes. Or if okay. it's a severe deformity and you think the fibula is going to get in the way. If it's a in mild to moderate deformity and like a two-ish centimeter uh, shortening, I don't think a fibula mm -hmm. needs to be cut. But it needs okay. to be stabilized distally. So it, you don't disrupt right. the motor. Right. The last question I think is, Jayant is again asking in obese kids, do you believe in the double eight plate, two eight plates? Yeah, yeah. I showed you a picture. I think it, it makes sense. <clears throat> what I... Uh, there are like two versions of it when many companies make it. You know, they have the eight plate and the H plate. I personally like to put two separate plates, the standard plates with, you know, non-cannulated or solid stainless steel Fun. screws. And the reason is the H plates, I think, are harder to contour. And if you don't contour them, sometimes the screws go in the, not in the right place. So I'll right. put two plates right next to each other. Okay. And uh, Dr. Sakti Das wanted to know whether the osteotomy you do is intra-articular or extra. Oh, for the plateau elevation? Yeah. Yeah, no, it is uh, by definition intra-articular, but you try to hinge it between the two tibial spines and you don't want to go past it. And another good trick is to get one of your Weber clamps or something, you know, or the, right. the, the, the tong yeah. to kind of do, hold you it. know, compress it, it hold it. Yeah. And, and yeah. keep an eye on it as you're sort of tamping the graft. Right. So I have a case later. Maybe we can show it during the case presentation. Sure. So yeah. shall we go to the cases? Can I share my screen now? Yeah, I'll... Uh, yeah. I'll what do I have to do? Yeah, nothing. I, 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 I'll I start sharing my okay. screen. Got it. Okay, so I, I think uh, we will start with the first case, which is from Tushar Agarwan. Tushar, are you there? No, Sandeep, that's mine. Uh, that's not Tushar's. Okay, sorry. Sorry. Let me just uh, readjust that. Hmm. I think I got the wrong one. Yeah. Is that okay, Tushar? No. Just a minute. I'll Tushar, unmute yourself. No, no, no. Tushar, can you unmute yourself? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. still seeing the same thing. No, no, I am just changing again. Uh, now, yeah. This is okay now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so Tushar, you can start with your case, please. Yeah, but you will be moving it ahead, right? I will move it, yes. Yeah. Okay, so uh, this uh, child had come to us uh, very early. And this is very early in this, uh, around 2008. And uh, I was tempted to tell the patient that, uh, you know, we should wait rather three, three and a half years. 
maybe up to three and a half years, maybe to see whether you're going to grow out of it. Most of the kids grow out of it. So uh, uh, fortunately, we didn't because the that time I read the paper and we found that a metadiaphysio angle in 17 degrees uh, would be uh, in more in the favor of a pre blounts disease. Okay. So the next slide. So yeah, just raise your hand. So then what happened is that we came across this at the 13 to 16 degrees metadiaphysio angle actually require bracing 11 to 13 are significant enough to fall off and more than 16 you can go for early osteotomy. We went, Sandeep, uh, so we went to, uh, and then there was the second paper which Sir has already mentioned. So then we'll go ahead. Uh, and then, okay, uh, so this is a very interesting paper which is uh, from in just 2009. Uh, paper out of Korea, which actually says that to let a child be significant enough for him to be entered into your sort of follow-up angle should be nine degrees. And you should have two sequential x-rays and up to 36 months, you can watch for correction. And they have found that kids who correct less than six degrees per year are physiological or rather are blounds and those who correct more than six degrees per year would be physiological. So we go okay, ahead. So, so you recommend that two x-rays should be done six months apart. Two x-rays. Yeah. Two x-rays. So and, even if it's and for a child to be recruited in your follow-up, he should have a metadiaphysio angle of more than nine degrees. More than nine degrees. If it is less than nine. If the metadiaphysio angle of the TBI is less than nine degrees, you can safely call it physiological and not physiological. keep the child. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is their conclusion. Next. Oh, this is what we did with the case. So I did an acute tibial correction. Uh, use the jazz fixator very commonly, especially in the younger child, supported with a plaster. Next, please. Uh, then we added a growth plate at the time of fixator removal. And uh, next, please. And we have a long follow up. We removed the growth plate. And uh, she overcorrected into valgus and then straightened off sequentially. Next. So as you see, she this is at four years, then at six years, uh, at seven years, at nine years, and now 12 years. So she is as ramrod straight. And this is what it is. So had we waited and watched, probably she would have sort of not, could have not worked out so well. Right. The next so if you can just summarize the message from this case for us. I think the most important thing I learned was to watch out for the uh, tibial, proximal tibial metadiaphysio angle. If it's more okay. than 17 okay. degrees static value, or if you have two sequential x-rays where you see less than three degrees correction in six months, you can take a call. And like okay. what so, sir said, uh, we can go in very early now, uh, as early as just to intervene. Okay. Sanjeev, any comment on this case? Yeah, no, I mean, great result to sir. Uh, excellent. But I guess uh, two, two little comments. One is that I think in this day and age for the child, and, and I agree with you in terms of, you know, getting sequential x-rays a few months apart, if you're not sure, just to see what's happening. Um, but I think some people, including myself, would probably go towards guided growth. If it's a mild to moderate deformity, let's say in a three-year-old, uh, compared to an osteotomy. And my second comment was to do with the femur. Do you think the femur, so, you know, this goes back to a younger child who may have an LDFA of, you know, way more than 88. But yeah. like we said in our study, that's physiologic because if you look at non blounds population, normal population, their femur is going to be in various too. For, right. for, you know, up to five, six, seven years. So, so I so probably sure. your yeah go ahead sorry so your probably summary is that you would have done a proximal tibial growth modulation rather than that osteotomy which Tushar did yeah and and but and lower, and lower family, femur is already in valgus and and the, yeah and I, I don't know if the and obviously I don't have all the X-rays but I don't think it's very unusual to have to do the femur for early onset. So yeah. young, okay, okay, okay. okay. Late Let's go to the second. Blouse. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Right. So we got the message that for the lower femur to deform, the child should grow. 
he doesn't have a bad angle in the femur at such a young age and you so have the, proved with your paper that it is physiological so the eight plate should be reserved in the distal femur for a older age older yes. age yes. Yes. yes okay and, okay and tushar this time on the yeah. x-ray measurements right tushar it depends yeah. on what the x-ray show okay is to tushar yeah so so this was uh, the unilateral varus uh, there was a video here which is not playing but uh, now again this child is 2 years uh, yeah so so again i was tempted to wait but uh, we'll proceed uh, sir. Uh, so sir what so these are two x rays july 2019 and october 2019 uh, they don't seem to be growing out so uh, the pa parents were getting restless so here uh, i did a guided growth for both femur and tibia so would this be okay or this is again an overkill uh i mean i i don't think the femur necessarily is needed uh yeah. so yeah i i would have done the tibia and that that looks beautiful and just for the audience even though the plate looks prominent that's all cartilage and i bet you it's right against the cartilage and you you obviously don't want to damage the perichondrium so i'm uh, i'm pleased with the tibia i don't know if i would have done the femur yeah so this patient is still on follow up i just wish to ask this patient does have lot of prominence of the plate and the gait pattern is a little uh, so uh, what is your take and what is your experience how do we counsel them yeah no no and and that is true and especially in the proximal tibia and i think that's one of the reasons because of that offset between the epiphysis and the metaphysis in the lateral portion of the proximal tibia that you can sometimes i've used a titanium plate and there are certain companies that have a offset plate especially for the proximal tibia uh, so i think those are good or even if you don't have an offset plate you can contour it a little bit so that it's closer to the metaphysis uh, you know uh, in the metaphysical yeah. fragment but so it can still be prominent it can be prominent and then the final thing which was not a question you asked but we could put the metaphysical screw pretty long you know so that things don't pull out i've seen a case or two where one of these screws will start pulling out so pulling out yeah no that does problem. happen i sure yeah yeah there's there's no problem with putting the metaphysical screw a little further longer so that's a good tip you put the metaphysical screw longer because it does back out or cut out as it grows And Kushan, this is a COVID surgery. You buy it in a mask. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Follow up is <laughs> right now. <laughs> okay, so this was Tushar's conclusion. If you can just summarize. Yeah. So board legs in the younger child be watchful, and uh, you could wait till thirty six months. But the most important is the proximal uh, <laughs> metaphysio angle of more than seventeen degrees. to include in your follow up this should be more than 90 degrees at start and should correct then 3 degrees in 6 months okay right? and have this concept of pre blowns in mind thank you thank you so i think i'll move on where to share left off this is one of my cases in infantile blown you can see you you said sanjeev uh, young blowns is usually bilateral but we see more rickets bilateral and oh. if it is unilateral we consider that we should be looking out for blowns and exactly. the angle and angles that tushar mentioned yeah, so yeah. any comment on that yeah so i think you're right it's not that it's not unilateral and early onset compared to late onset it's much more common to be bilateral that's okay. the only thing that came out of that meta analysis that compared right. to early onset and and the point was that they may be just different diseases okay. and, and one okay. other interesting thing that i didn't mention that we looked at another paper looking at the correlation of bmi with limb deformity and while mm -hmm. the bmi was less overall for early onset they had more severe deformity which tells okay. you that the growth plate may be more sensitized to compressive forces in the younger yes. child okay so so this one as as you know you you we got an mri done and we found that there is no real facial bar and i did a guided growth after an arthrogram and uh, looked pretty okay uh, over a period of time it did straighten out as time went by but if you see the parents were not very happy 
because there was significant torsion. So the question here was the virus did collect correct in the coronal plane, but the torsional profile did not improve, and they were still pretty unhappy because to their eyes it was still crooked. So do you have experience, and what do you do about the torsion at such a young age? Yeah, I mean, you know, you can counsel them. A lot of times they've got torsion on the other side too. So, so the other one, if you see, is normal, straight. Is not, yeah, yeah. It's and unilateral. Here, so here again, you know, I don't know what the mechanical axis is like. I would keep overcorrecting it. <clears throat> you can again, if you were to put the plate a little bit more anteriorly, I guess it'll give you more of a torsional thing. Honestly, okay. I haven't played around with it that much, and that much. I haven't found it to be a big, big problem. And okay. sometimes, at least some of the torsion will correct. With the, okay. with the wheels. So, so now this particular case, as you pointed out, see the lower screw has started backing off and it did come off at time of removal. You see this had walked off and there still was significant torsion. So at time of removal, I did a derotational osteotomy, but I used a plate to stabilize it and I put one screw like a staple screw so that this acts like a growth modulation in addition for some more time. And then I got the leg straightened out to a normal valgus, and then I took the implant out. So torsional problem, I don't know whether putting the plate anterior, it will, as you said, we don't have so much experience. But I think all of us should remember that there is a significant torque also, which may contribute to the deformity. It's a three-dimensional deformity, as uh, Sanjeev, Sanjeev has already said. Sandeep, can I ask you a question? Yeah. yeah. Is there a lower tibial virus? Uh, not really. It's Your previous not... X-ray? No, I didn't measure it separately here. Okay, okay. I attributed everything to the proximal deformity. So that was that. So the second case that I got with a similar age group, I did not bother with growth modulation. I did a combined procedure where I did the growth modulation with the derotation osteotomy. And there was a significant uh, undergrowth on this side. and but. The, the, the point I wanted to make was then I could get an acute correction at one go. They did not need a second operation to correct that torsion. And this is how she looked. And over a period of time, the medial DBL physis started growing normally. Everything is fine. And then we've got the implants out. And that's a longer follow-up at eight years or nine years post-surgery. Uh, and everything looks uh, hunky-dory so far. So Sanjeev, any comments on this particular case? Yeah, no, I mean, th th these are great results, uh, Sandeep. I, I don't, I personally would do a little bit less and, you know, sow the seed because if you look at it, yes, even if there's residual tibial torsion, that hasn't been shown to be like a major functional problem in, you know, especially non neuromuscular kids. But yes, it, it is an eyesore. So I, I, maybe I just tend to ignore it. I think okay. uh, I do worry sometimes putting these implants across the growth plate in a young child, even mm -hmm. though you're trying to correct the torsion with an osteotomy. Um, you know, I, I just worry that if you get some kind of a physial injury, be that with a plate or with that screw that's going across onto the other side, it's just, uh, I wouldn't, yeah. So, I, I mean, you mean this good. Because well, this, this, screw, and, this and if you go so to this your, was all yeah. in cartilage. There was an arthrogram no, no, showing okay, that it's okay. No, no, it, it looks good. But go to your pre, like first post op. Uh, yeah, that one on the arthrogram. Like, yeah, is that going through? No, no, the next one, the metaphysical screw. Yeah. 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 No, this was is in that? cartilage. This was in cartilage. Yes, but that ossified over a period of time, as you see. Right, right. But okay, so but that cartilage was distal yeah. to the growth plate. It was, yeah, it, looked... it was distal. No, it is distal. Okay, got it. okay maybe yeah. just projection. Okay. Yes, you yeah. can see this here. Yeah, yeah. So good. that continued growing. Yeah. yeah so that is what I thought that, like, like you said, it may not be functional, but at least in India, when they are coming for a deformity correction, if you leave behind a torsion, they are not really happy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this was an adolescent blount. Again, this was operated twice earlier and had pretty bad deformities. Now here I did an acute correction. Uh, I know Cherry is going to show you similar fixator assisted corrections, but somebody was asking questions. So this is uh, just to demonstrate that you put a guide wire 
which goes to the intercondyle and the arch and you do an osteotomy hemiplato elevation here uh, but you are not really going into the joint you just crack it sort of green stick it leaving the cartilage hinge intact and then hold that fragment and uh, stable i use the fibula i resected the fibula to appropriate length to hold it up like a strut and then added a medial plate in addition so but i also did a double osteotomy so this, i don't i did not stage it since as you said earlier mm -hmm. but i did do a fasciotomy and i did a peroneal uh, i saw that the peroneal nerve is uh, not in problem situation so that is how it looked on table that was a double osteotomy and that was his opposite side so that was his correction at the end of the day uh, i put him in a slab for about 6 weeks and did not allow weight bearing and did both stage i didn't do both legs together but both osteotomies the uh, metaphyseal hemiplatic elevation and metadiaphyseal was together so ultimately we got this sort of an acute correction which is again possible with a fibula strut and a double plate so finally yeah, this, I, is this is the last sorry, uh, sorry can i just yeah. say one thing yeah. sorry. just to yes. clarify yes. i think what you did is is awesome and just to kind of where i was saying not to combine the two was if you're going to do the if somebody has a limb shortening and you need length also but i think this is actually a good indication to do both okay. because then you can stabilize length. both the elevation and the tibial osteotomy as long as you did everything that you talked about you know yes. fasciotomy yes. Yes. plus Absolutely. minus the decompression yeah anyway. it's quite an extensive surgery and you need to go very patiently for this so let me go to the last case that this was a nigerian who came in now again here i thought i thought that the growth plate looked pretty decent so in this particular case with, without a facial bar i did a metaphyseal osteotomy with a growth modulation so i combined growth uh, guided growth with an osteotomy here and opposite side i just did guided growth that is how uh, it looked at one year follow up she went home and then she kept on sending me x rays that was a two year follow up it looked pretty decent that was a four year follow up and the latest at maturity this was how she looked on the right and left so overall it went decently so like you said sometimes the adolescent blunt also may not be having a facial bar it's important to see whether there is growth available on the medial side and you can still combine a growth modulation with a metaphyseal osteotomy so any comments on that sanjeev yeah yeah and just one comment on the terminology you know like even the case with the plateau elevation that you showed yeah yeah the, that i bet you was an early onset with a later follow up so okay. because the yeah. typical late onset blounts will not have a plateau depression that's not okay. a common thing. that so, was operated earlier two times so that's what yeah, i mean probably so hydrogenic arrest yeah. exactly i i do find this concept interesting and it does make sense i've never done an osteotomy with a guided growth but my question to you is then what is your goal in terms of correction amount of correction with the osteotomy if you're going so, are you using the plate as a prophylactic thing or what no no the, the thing is that after the arthrogram if i find that there is no actual joint line depression yeah and the and or the mri does not show a facial bar which means yeah. no growth on medial side a growth modulation aligning the axis and derotating by doing a metadiaphyseal upper metadiaphyseal osteotomy does work that is what i'm but saying I, I, or showing I get it but but yeah. then then why add a guided growth plate if you're it, it, it was in varus huh? but it it did contribute if you see there was varus at the proximal side uh -huh. I see. Okay, so you feel the like they were like they were two. See, APC. they were parallel. The parallel screws have diverged, and the varus has disappeared over a time because of okay. correction at the growth plate. Right, right. But but I guess my question is, why not do a single osteotomy in between the growth plate and metadiaphysis, like kind of in the metaphysis, metaphysis. like a classic meta, and sort of correct or slightly overcorrect? Why do you need the guided growth? plate because my my concern is if this kid doesn't come back for follow up yeah. then you know you sort of Drift. setting yourself up goes into valgus yes yeah okay yeah just just a word of caution yes a point yeah. yeah yeah okay so i think cherry we can go yeah. to your case now yeah this is a two year old girl 
uh, she came with this problem. I'm sorry for the x-rays. We started on bracing, lost a follow-up. She came after three years. That's at the age of five years. Yeah, that's the picture, clinical picture. Yeah, these are the angles. The virus is 22 on the right and 17 on the left. Sorry about that because these are analog x-rays I had to mark on them. Yeah, and that's a gait. Now she's five years old. So like uh, everything I would put my threshold for doing an arthrogram is very low because anyway, I'm taking the patient for a procedure. So did found the articular surface intact. I mean, uh, no depression. So straight away, put a pre-made frame bilaterally. And uh, I prefer to use the illustrative frame, nothing else. It's a cost effective, that's why. And uh, that's a correction. You can see the translation, some amount of tra lateral translation that is occurred, which is needed. Yes. And that's the end point of correction. It's not that it's gone into over valgus. It's just that uh, the both rings are touching each other. That's the other thing. That's the end result. That's about uh, at the time of frame removal. Yes. Next. That's about over correction. And seven years later. That's a full-length X-ray. And can we just have the video? Yeah. Coming to yeah, just a couple of questions. The one is Tusha's question is, is it a pediatric frame? No, well, when you're using the Elizabeth frame, there is nothing like pediatric. You just use the appropriate ring size, Tusha. Okay. There's nothing like a pediatric frame. So question to you, Cherry, you lengthened also. Why did you lengthen when you were just doing a deformity correction? I think that no, it just uh, happened anyway. I mean, both, both the sides were equalized. So I didn't bother much about that. I didn't want to shorten it. Anyway, she would be a little more taller. I mean, both the sides were equal. Like. <laughs> they will be happier. She will be happier. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this over a little bit of overcorrection. Now, what is the opinion about this overcorrection is what I want to ask. So Sanjeev, what's your comment on this? Yeah, well, again, it depends on how much, what the physis looks like and what the kid's age is. So, as I said, I think a slight overcorrection is good for the classic early onset blounds. But, you know, the irony is that the older child, you worry about recurrence, which is what I showed you in that one case where I overcorrected, but then she had advanced bone age and she was stuck in valgus. So, yes. I think for those cases, it's good to like, really carefully look at not just the proximal tibia, but the distal femoral growth plates, look at their skeletal maturity, ask them about if it's a female menses, and for boys, look at axillary here, tanner stages, that kind of thing. So I think if all things are equal, slight overcorrection is probably recommended, but it just, just watch out for the yeah. older child. Especially in the older child. Yeah. And in the younger child, watch out for cousins, if that exists. I, I, yeah, I don't know if it exists for blounds, but yeah, but, but maybe it does. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So second case by Cherry. Yeah. Now, this is a quite an interesting case, probably one of the toughest cases I had done. She's an 11-year-old girl. Notice bowel legs at the age of one and a half years, the parents. Seen an orthopedic surgeon at about uh, three months later, diagnosed as blounds disease. This is all from the history and braced at the age of two years, and at the age of four years, told surgery. Next. Now, being my home state, as Sanjeev knows, Ayurveda is very popular. Oh, so they did you. Ayurvedic yeah. massage for another two that years. That has he cured COVID in Kerala, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, thank you for bringing it here. I may have been the pilot. <laughs> but but the in, <laughs> interesting part is the well-educated parents, well of family, and then they notice no improvement. Okay, then went to the same surgeon at the age of seven years. I mean, I don't know what they were doing. They were really, really fooling around. Did an osteotomy, deformity not corrected well, and I don't have any previous records. So this is the picture. Sanjeev, so how, any? Uh, how old? How old? How old? Now, is about the now 11, she's around. Right? 12 she's years, around, you said in the period. Yeah, to 12 years. Okay, so Cherry, can we see the x rays again, please? Yeah. X rays, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, you know, it looks like, again, we don't have all the angles and all. I, and it looks like most of the problems is, is again, epiphyseal with some metaphyseal problem, including procurvartum. 
Now, yeah. if you have available, I find a 3D CT really helpful for these cases. Yeah. You know, because it makes you, it helps you with the plan. It tells you what the plateau looks like. And, you know, in terms of depression, this and that. So I would do that. And if you can't get that, then get dedicated views of the knee, including obliques. And I get a those. stand. Yeah. yeah. Because, yeah, so I. I we did the stress so, views to just to yeah, see that. Beautiful. That's a great, that's, uh, that's again, uh, a good idea to do a stress view because it shows you two things. Are these in full extension, Cherry? Oh, they're perfect. Is the stress view with the knee in full extension? Yeah. Okay, good, yeah. So yeah, you could see that. And I think the 3D CT is helpful. And just like the one of the cases I showed, there is a depression that's not just peripheral, but central. Yeah. And I think uh, as expected, it's depressed more posteriorly than anteriorly. So, um, Excellent. Yeah. So what about his femur? And I would measure, you know, the joint orientation angle. I suspect the femur is not in varus, but don't know. Um, the you know, having said okay. that, yeah, yeah. Okay, and, and this is again where you would draw those three sets of lines and angles to, to quantify how much is coming from the epiphysis, how much is coming from the metaphysis. Uh, yeah. And, and okay, so what did you do? Yeah, the next was... Now the question is, I mean, it's stage six. So the options were whether one level, two levels, osteotomy, single stage, multiple stage. Now, one thing I wanted to, always I wanted to bring out the point for the audience is appreciate two deformities, intraarticular and metaphysial. That's something very important because many a time, the, I think the previous surgeon that did not appreciate the uh, intraarticular deformity, just did the metaphysial osteotomy. So we did the uh, articular surface elevation, fibula strut grafting, and fixed it with screws. That's a picture. Now the various the angles we measured. Yeah, Sandeep, a little slow, please. Yeah, fix okay. the frame on. Yeah. So uh, the right left side. Can we go back to the previous slide, Sandeep? Just a minute. So on the left side, we, uh, yeah, left side we had the oblique plane deformity, and uh, on the right side we just had a coronal plane deformity only. Sorry, the other way around. Next slide. So left side oblique plane deformity and right side coronal plane deformity. But I decided to put the frame on on both the sides. Next. So. Orthofix, a lot of options. I prefer the Elisero. Again, the cost effective and TSF is not really available. Now, the SUV is available. Now, that's a frame that's put. Osteotomy. That's a gradual distraction. Yeah, correcting. Correcting. Yes. Now, once we corrected the deformity, we noticed uh, internal rotation deformity that is more on the right, not much on the left. But a lot of internal rotation deformity on the right. That's assessed clinically because we didn't, I didn't bother to take a CT scan. Next, something, please, if you don't mind. Yeah. So we did the derotation construct again with the LSRO. So you can see the amount of translation that has occurred with the region right in both the sites, but more on the right. Yeah. That's a remodeling. Next. That's the end result with the frame missing. That's after frame removal. Next, please. Yeah, that's one year follow up. She's got a good knee function. Now, this is a follow up six years later. That's the x ray. You can see the right and left both have remodeled quite well. And that's a Now, the one message I want to give the audience is don't get terrified of the deformity. Keep the petal straight, the deformity becomes clear. Do a good clinical examination, proper x-rays, including stress x-rays, proper malalignment test, and CT MRI as needed. Then decide on acute gradual correction, internal or external fixation, and select your implant. The most important thing is spend time with the patient, discuss the pros and cons.
that's a right. so, super super case sanjeev excellent, you want excellent. no i i think this demonstrated and highlighted all the all the points that we talked about and i'm sure you did it and this kid was older but uh, always remember to do the lateral proximal tibial epiphysiodesis when you're lifting the plateau up in a yeah. child who's still growing yeah i had done that i had done that i forgot to mention yeah, so sure. so proximal nice. tibular epiphysiodesis should be added most of the time yeah most of the time yeah again yeah. if if the kid is not doesn't have too much growth let's say it's that 12 year old range then you don't always have to do it but i think the added advantage with that is that you scrape it you can sometimes put a small cannulated screw as well and right. in a in a weird way it does sort of hold and perhaps tighten it a little bit yeah absolutely absolutely yeah. so i think we are bang on time we are just 1 minute short of 9 pm over here <laughs> so i think sanjeev if you could just summarize and give us some messages at early middle and late late just sort of an overview of whatever we spoke today words yeah. of wisdom oh no i don't know if it's wisdom <laughs> but uh, little good night lullaby um no i i think the first thing starting from the beginning you know like we said er, early onset blount differentiate between physiologic and blounts and way to do it is besides clinical exam look at the the body habitus a lot of times it's obese and then when you're getting x rays good full length standing x rays don't just look at the tibia yes measure the metadiaphysical angle but look at the femur also okay and so that's one and keep in mind that the adult numbers for joint orientation angles are not the same for children especially till age 7 i think careful use of guided growth instead of bracing for those 2 to 3 and a half year 4 year old is becoming more established with arthrogram is a good thing um <clears throat> i think as the child gets older you think about osteotomies look at you know unilateral bilateral acute gradual but more importantly going back to the family and telling them that you're in here for the long haul it's not over till you reach skeletal maturity even if you do a small outpatient procedure like a guided growth even more important to sort of retain you know follow up yeah. consistently then as you get older in the late onset blunts which i don't think you see that much in india none of these cases actually that you guys showed were adolescent yeah. classic adolescent blunts they were all residual early onset which is yeah. an interesting sidebar that we could study at some point but for the adolescent blounts at least that's seen in north america a lot of times some varus is coming from the femur so make sure you address that minimize joint obliquity as much as possible uh, and use you know stable constructs and the usual orthopedic principles thank you super i think uh, niran bhai if you can just uh, Yes, uh, thank you. Word of thanks. Yeah, thank you, Sanjeev, for uh, sharing your experience and uh, wisdom with us, and uh, all of our panelists for sharing their cases and a good interaction. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Stay safe. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. In this instant recorder, it will be available on YouTube and Ortho TV and Posi website. So thank you very much, and have a good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah.